In South Africa, I was affronted by the sheer impressions of poverty, and the miles and miles of shanty towns, of shacks made out of scrap wood, scrap tin, scrap metal, cardboard, and millions of people lived there on the edge. In spite of its problems though, including having the highest number of HIV positive people on earth, South Africa has one of the few functioning economies on the continent, and Cape Town is one of its centers, so millions of migrants come, move here, looking for work. And this itinerant, mobile, moving culture helps create a whole phenomenon where HIV is spread and sexually transmitted. Tomizin Ndile, she was a typical migrant woman who'd come looking for work. She was probably infected by her husband, and she was then abandoned. When I first met her, she was very thin. She was dressed in a winter coat, and it wasn't even cold. Between the first and second trip, she had really dramatically improved, seemed to be in good spirits, and was living in Gugulutu Township in her grandmother's other house. She was here to find a job, to get ahead in life, and to start over. In the world today, 60 people out of every 100 live in a shanty town, usually on the edge of a city. And one person in six in the world lives in a squatter settlement, which means they've got no land deed or no title to the land they live on. Unemployment hoovers probably around 60%, and there's nothing for the young people to do except hang out, drink, look for work sometimes, do nothing, get lost. This is a housewarming party. The family just finished paying for the house. They just paid off their mortgage. So it was a village family too, a, a traditional family from a village somewhere in the Eastern Cape. And you can see them here banging on the walls, which are wobbling. Now, Alcona was a different story. She had a violent background. I don't know all the details, but her boyfriend, the father of her child, was murdered. He'd been killed with a gunshot when she was three months pregnant. During my first trip to the clinic, Akona had just discovered she was HIV positive. She could not accept her own condition. Since I've been on treatment, I've been doing well. I never had side effects. I know that ARBs work. When I was cancelled, I was told that I can protect my baby. I will continue with my ARVs so that I can prolong life. The first time I met Lito, she was in a wheelchair. She had advanced tuberculosis. She was very skeletal and she couldn't walk because of nerve damage on the bottom of her feet. 
When I met her for the second time on my second trip, she was really happy to see me. And this acceptance of myself by her made it easy for me to be with her. She was incredibly resilient. She was open. And this openness about her own status and the acceptance of it by her family and by her community saved her life. Her house was just a two-room shack where eight people lived. I couldn't imagine. But she helped take care of her brothers and her sisters, her niece, her nephew, her parents, and she seemed to be very well adjusted. On Good Friday, the congregation stayed up praying and singing all night, celebrating. What were they celebrating? I guess the resurrection from the dead. Go measure the distance from Cape Town to Pretoria and tell me the prescribed area I can work in. Count the number of days in a year and say how many of them I could be contracted around. Calculate the size of a house you think good for me and ensure the shape suits tribal tastes. Measure the amount of light into the window, known to guarantee my traditional ways. Count me enough wages to make certain that I grovel in the mud for more food. Teach me just so much of the world that I can fit into certain types of labor. Show me only those kinds of love which will make me aware of my place at all times. And when all that is done, let me tell you this, you'll never know how far I stand from you. <laughs> <laughs> 